go for it. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Jesse. I'm going to be presenting on progressive gray matter loss in patients with bipolar disorder. And I realized that this is kind of an old paper. It was published in 2007. Um, so as I was researching for stuff to add in the background, I found a lot more research, recent research which confirmed that people with bipolar disorder do have progressive gray matter loss. So that was good to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for our. I know what you're <laughs> Um, so according to the DSM-5 um, bipolar disorder, which um, is kind of off and on, also known as manic depressive disorder or bipolar affective disorder, um, causes unusual, unusual shifts in mood, energy, activity levels, and um, also the ability to carry out daily living tasks. So um, in the DSM-5, it's placed between chapters on schizophrenia, schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. Um, as well as depressive disorders. Uh, so it is related to schizophrenia in terms of um, <coughs> implicated brain structures and um, some of the uh, processes that happen in order to or, uh, that cause some of the symptoms, but it's not the same thing. Um, and then to better explain it, um, I thought I could explain it, but I also found a video which I thought may be better. Um, but also when I was looking up bipolar disorder, I found this picture. And I don't know if it's just me, but the manic guy seems like he's just in finals week. Um, uh, he does not look too happy. He's doing anything to avoid studying. Yeah, he's cleaning I, his I, stove. I don't know. Like, yeah. So anyways. I've done a lot of cleaning when I had academic work that was due. But his face is just so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really doesn't look manic. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you've heard the term bipolar used to describe <laughs> someone who's moody or who has mood swings. But this colloquial use of the term is really different from bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder, which used to be called manic depression, is a serious mental illness that causes a person to have dramatic shifts in emotions, mood, and energy levels, moving from extreme lows to extreme highs. But these shifts don't happen moment to moment. They usually happen over several days or weeks. There are a few different types of bipolar disorders, but there are some common features. First, the low moods are identical to those in a related disorder, major depressive disorder, also known as unipolar depression. Individuals with this can feel hopeless and discouraged, lack energy and mental focus, and can have physical symptoms like eating and sleeping too much or too little. But along with these lows, the thing that sets bipolar disorders apart from unipolar depression is that individuals can have periods of high moods, which are called manic episodes or hypomanic episodes, depending on their level of severity. In a manic state, people can feel energetic, overly happy or optimistic, even euphoric with really high self-esteem. And on the surface, these might seem like really positive characteristics. But when someone's in a full manic episode, these symptoms can reach a dangerous extreme. A person experiencing mania might invest all of their money in a risky business venture, or they might behave recklessly. Individuals might have pressured speech where they talk constantly at a rapid fire pace, or they might have racing thoughts and might feel wired as if they don't need sleep. Manic episodes can also include delusions of grandeur. Like, for example, they might believe that they're on a personal mission from God, or that they have some supernatural power. And finally, they might make poor decisions without any regard for later consequences. One way to understand these swings is by charting them on a graph. So let's say that the y-axis is mood, with mania and depression being on the far end of the axis, and the x-axis is time. The average healthy individual might have normal ups and downs throughout their life, and they might even have some pretty serious lows once in a while, maybe after losing a job or moving to a new place and feeling lonely. An individual with unipolar depression, though, might have normal highs, but they'll probably also have some crushing lows that last for a long period of time and might not even have an obvious trigger. Now, for the bipolar disorders, the first one is called bipolar 1 
And these are people that have some major lows that last at least two weeks, and then some major highs that last at least a week or require hospitalization. That said, untreated manic episodes can last as long as three to six months. And even though depression is seen in most cases, it's not actually required for a diagnosis. The second one is called bipolar two. And this is when a person experiences similar lows and has additional highs called hypomania, which are less severe manic episodes than we see in bipolar one. To qualify for a diagnosis, these hypomanic states need to last for at least four days. Once again though, these symptoms generally last a few weeks to a few months. All right, the third one's called cyclothymia, or sometimes cyclothymic disorder. And these people have milder lows as well as milder highs, or hypomania like you see in bipolar two. And they cycle back and forth between these two over a period lasting at least two years. Sometimes people with bipolar disorder can show other less common symptoms as well. For example, having what are referred to as mixed episodes experiencing symptoms of both depression and mania at the same time. Another symptom they might have is rapid cycling, which describes a situation where a person has four or more episodes of depression or mania within a given year. Like most mental health conditions, the exact underlying cause of bipolar disorder isn't known, and there's no single bipolar gene that's been identified. But it's thought that there are genetic and environmental factors that play a part. For example, one interesting clue is that people with family members who have bipolar disorders are 10 times more likely to have it themselves. Another clue is that some drugs and medications can trigger manic episodes, like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRI. It's also worth mentioning that people with bipolar disorder often have other disorders like anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorders, ADHD, and personality disorders as well, making diagnosis and treatment a real challenge. Even though there's no cure for bipolar disorder, identifying and treating individuals is really important, since there's a real danger that the person could harm themselves or even commit suicide. One of the oldest treatments is also one of the most effective treatments, and that's lithium salts. Lithium acts as a mood stabilizer, smoothing out the highs and the lows that they experience. That said, it's much better at treating manic rather than depressive episodes, and so individuals who take it often have to take other medications as well which can be problematic since some antidepressants, like SSRIs, can trigger manic episodes in people that are predisposed to them. Other treatment options include antipsychotics, anticonvulsants, and benzodiazepines. But many of these, including lithium, have side effects that can be severe and lead to non-adherence, which can be dangerous for the person. Now, unlike certain disorders like unipolar depression, psychological interventions like talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy are not particularly effective in treating the manic episodes of bipolar disorder. Having said that, they can still be very helpful tools to help someone with bipolar disorder in general, especially after a manic episode has ended. They can also help the person handle stressful situations that might otherwise lead to a manic episode, thereby helping to prevent a potential manic episode in the first place. All right, so super fast recap. Bipolar disorder is a mental disorder characterized by depression periods of lowered mood, as well as mania, periods of a heightened mood. Thanks for watching. You can help support us by donating on Patreon or subscribing. Okay, so um, he described a few different uh, types of bipolar disorder and there are actually more. Um, but I decided not to include them and focus on bipolar 1 because that's uh, the type that they focus on in the paper. Um, so just a really quick recap, bipolar 1 um, is involved with um, having major depressive episodes but also manic episodes. Um, if you're in a manic episode, you may speak really fast, um, like in an uninterruptible manner where you're just really excited about everything and you no one can stop you. Um, you might also be easily distracted, have raising thoughts, you might want to paint your entire house one night or move to some you know, country in the middle of the ocean or um, have lots of sex. Uh, if you're in a major depressive episode, then you will have persistent feelings of sadness, um, anxiety, guilt, hopelessness, you can't sleep well, you probably can't eat well either. Um, 
you have fatigue and loss of interest. Um, and like you said, um, these episodes need to last at least seven days in order to be diagnosable. Um, also, like you said, there are no, no established causes of bipolar disorder, um, but there are several, several factors that may be involved. Um, probably the most important being genetics and or family history. Um, I couldn't really find anything uh, specifically implicating any gene or um, string of genetic code saying that this causes bipolar disorder, um, but there was a paper that found a protein um, which is implicated in the etiology of the disorder, um, which is diacylglycrylkinase eta, which is a key protein in a lithium sensitive um, metabolic signaling pathway, which I read about. I don't know if I could really explain it um, that well, but basically, um, in people who have bipolar disorder, there's um, certain genes that might affect um, certain enzymes or proteins that uh, are involved in this uh, signaling process, which lithium is particularly effective on. I can make a quick comment. That's uh, that diacylglycerol kinase eta. It's a, a really common second messenger in cells, which basically means that it's critically important for cellular metabolism in a lot of different kinds of cells. So. It's kind of a big, it's a bad thing to have a problem with because it's really pervasive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing is that uh, bipolar disorder is believed to be a polygenic disease um, with a lot of genes maybe having a small influence on um, the cause rather than just one or two. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also, lower white matter integrity. Um, or volume in the right temporal lobe may be a biomarker for genetic risk, um, as well as brain matter deficits in um, both the right anterior cingulate gyrus and the ventral striatum, which are both involved in emotional processing. Um, so it's not necessarily that these this gray matter deficit is um, just in the presence of bipolar disorder, but it might also be um, indicative of a genetic risk. Uh, to further illustrate that, um, some cross-sectional studies have shown that higher numbers of manic episodes um, are associated with less gray matter volume uh, in prefrontal brain areas. Uh, and I think that's uh, mainly why they focused on bipolar 1 disorder in a lot of research, but also in the paper that I'm going to present because um, it does involve those manic episodes, whereas bipolar 2 or uh, cyclothymia uh, involve hypomania, which isn't quite uh, as intense, or I don't think it's as involved in terms of structures and processes. Um, there's also neuroanatomical abnormalities, which may act as risk factors for bipolar disorder, not um, just uh, consequences of having this disorder. So possible risk factors may include volumetric abnormalities in um, light matter, the striatum, uh, hippocampus, amygdala, and the subgenual prefrontal cortex, which I didn't know was the Broadman area 25, which is why I included uh, pictures in case anyone else didn't know. Um, this blue arrow pointing to the number 25 right here is the subgenual prefrontal cortex. And uh, if you want to see a more realistic view of it, the top picture. That's not a real brain. <laughs> okay, um, so these areas are um, involved in thinking, long term memory, as well as emotional processing. Uh, finally, the larger right inferior frontal gyrus, um, the volume of that could aid in the identification of subjects at risk for bipolar disorder. Um, So now some background for the study specifically. Um, studies of people with bipolar disorder have shown a reduced cell number or dysplasia in the hippocampus, as well as structural abnormalities in the amygdala. 
uh, where um, they found volumes increase in adults with um, bipolar disorder, and they found volume decreases in the amygdala for children and adolescents with bipolar. Um, so that means that children and adolescents had smaller amygdalas compared to adults. So that's kind of implying that as the disease progresses, um, the amygdala gets bigger. It does. It does imply that. Okay. So um, also the amygdala and hippocampus provide inputs to the prefrontal striatal thalamic circuits, which are involved in emotional functions, um, which make them of particular interest to bipolar disorder. Uh, also, functional imaging studies have found that um, abnormal metabolism and activation of the amygdala and hippocampus in bipolar patients. <laughs> and also, the direction of this effect depends on the emotional valence of the stimuli. So, um, they've done studies where they show bipolar patients uh, pictures of emotional faces and they have to um, recognize what expression they're making. And, um, I'm pretty sure that the more uh, manic episodes they experience, the less likely they are to um, judge a facial expression correctly. Additional structure and cognitive abnormalities uh, may be acquired with each further episode of the illness, which then in turn uh, leads to increased likelihood of relapse. Um, so, for instance, those with a greater degree of cognitive impairment have a worse prognosis, um, meaning they might not live as long or they might have more episodes. Um, bipolar disorder is also associated with deficits in memory function, and uh, other evidence suggests that uh, the hippocampus is closely involved with this association. Uh, no studies have directly related cognitive deficits um, in people with bipolar disorder to the medial temporal lobe volume reductions that are often seen. Uh, so there may be a progressive element to the pathophysiology of bipolar disorder that's mediated by this progressive hippocampal reduction or atrophy. So the authors of the study um, hypothesized that patients with bipolar disorder would show progressive hippocampal reductions and they used this uh, special analysis uh, methodology on their MRI scans, which they collected um, a baseline and then also another scan four years later. And they also predicted that gray matter reductions would be related to changes in cognitive performance occurring over that four year period. This study was done in Scotland, so America is not the only crazy <laughs> place. Um, this was 10 years ago. Um, they collected uh, 21 patients that had bipolar 1 disorder and also matched 21 controls who were recruited from the community. And actually, um, they, these, the control patients were people that the bipolar patients knew. So they weren't related to them in any way, um, but they were just social contacts. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting for them to do it that way. Um, the bipolar patients were identified from caseloads of consultant psychiatrists that the researchers were affiliated with. They, of course, had to fulfill, at the time, the DSM-4 criteria for bipolar 1 disorder. Uh, and then their diagnoses were also, also established using the operational criteria symptom checklist and further confirmed using the structured clinical interview for the DSM-4. They were clinically stable at study entry. Uh, they had the mean duration of the disorder for around 14 years, and uh, their median number of previous hospitalizations was around four. Um, and I thought this was important to uh, point out because uh, the more hospitalizations that one with bipolar disorder has had uh, could lead to you know, more medication or um, possibly even more therapy, which could affect the outcome or the symptoms. Uh, their controls also lived in the same region as everyone, and they were confirmed to not have bipolar disorder. So participants were group matched for age, sex, and pre-morbid IQ. Uh, I assume it's just a control for any um, brain differences that they might have, whether it be 
um, across sex or age, um, particularly when they're comparing people who have a mental illness with people who don't. Um, the exclusion criteria for both of the groups was they could not have a history of head injury, they could not have a lot neurological disorder, any drug dependence, learning disabilities, couldn't be pregnant or have implants, I'm assuming for the MR uh, machine. So really, besides the history of head injury, you know, Sasha, you don't think you'd be able to participate. Well, and the implants. <laughs> I, and I basically have all of those except the pregnancy. So. <laughs> I'm trying to get in with, uh, what's his name? What's his name from Junior? Hmm? Movie Junior? Can't remember. With Arnold Schwarzenegger and... Uh, oh, that, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, where he uh, gets pregnant? Yeah. Mm. Uh, Danny DeVito? Yeah, Danny DeVito. I'm trying to get in contact with him so he can get me pregnant, because I want a child from that man. Good luck with that. <laughs> I think he'd be a really good father or mother. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, related to that, that relates to the study. <laughs> so uh, they also collected clinical and cognitive measures to um, see if the gray matter loss. Uh, I love the name of that first scale. The young mania. The young mania rating scale. For some reason, that seems very funny to me. Is that because the person's name was young, or you know, was it just for young mania? <laughs> I bet we don't know, do we? No. Someone will find out in the next thirty seconds. I predict. Um, so their clinical uh, symptoms were assessed by a psychiatrist using the Young Mania Rating Scale, the uh, Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, and the Positive and Negative Symptom Scale, which is based on findings that schizophrenia comprises at least two distinct syndromes um, of positive uh, productive symptoms and negative uh, de deficit features. So um, just to kind of show that these two disorders are related. Um, all subjects went a, underwent a baseline assessment of their pre-morbid IQ using the NART, which I need to add a note of the full name, which I don't have. I, I like the NART. That's a so, great name. Um, and also a current performance of verbal IQ. Um, their memory was assessed repeatedly. Um, and this test, the RBMT, which I don't know the full name of because I don't have notes for, um, was shown to be sensitive to subtle changes in everyday memory function, and this is important because we're uh, looking at hippocampal deficits. I don't really see how they got their pre-morbid IQ unless they went back in time an <laughs> average of 14 years. Yeah, I think for them, the pre-morbid was before the it got worse in the four years. Oh, well, maybe so, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we yeah. They should be all of that. Hmm. Like their baseline IQ at the beginning of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't include like average age of the participants yeah, I was or any other ask kind about of that. descriptive. Yeah. Uh, they used a 1.5 TGE MRI scanner, which I found one on eBay for $200,000 in case anyone's in the <laughs> uh, They took a midline sagittal localization followed by two additional sequences to image the whole brain. So 1.5, that's 1.5 Tesla, so that's like a moderate power MRI, that's not a super powered one. Yeah, right? and this was 10 years ago, yeah. So. Yeah. so. probably back then it was a super powered yeah. one. Yeah. And GE stands for General Electric, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tried to find videos or pictures or anything to explain this tensor-based morphometry, um, but as I read and tried to summarize it for the presentation, it's not that difficult to understand. It's actually um, just a form of analysis uh, for the brain images. So basically, it identifies differences in local shape in brain structures and also examines the relative volumes of those structures. So it just looks at shape and volume, which is what we are interested in for the study. Um, it uses a high dimensional warping field. I've been watching way too much Star Trek. 
um, to match an image of a subject's anatomy from a base point to its shape later on, so baseline to four years for the study. Um, it's able to distinguish intrinsic changes in brain anatomy from these translational shifts, which are caused by imperfect image registration, which uh, I guess happens in MRI scans. And they went on and on in the paper about how tensor-based morphometry is so much better than voxel-based morphometry. So, can you go back to the slide right before? See how it says midline sagittal localization. So I think what they do is they they like set up these. Um, like benchmarks in the brain and they scan it and then four years later they scan it again and they still have these same benchmarks so what they then try to do is overlay the new scan on the old scan but because there are differences in the way the scan is taken some of the differences between the images are not the result of differences in the brain they're just a result of trying to overlay the two things accurately on each other right so somehow this method compensates for that so that the differences between the two images are really based on differences in the brain instead of just crappy methodology so it's like they talk about a warp field they what they mean is if you have like let's say you're trying to uh you've got a study with 10 people in it and you want to look at all of their brain scans at the same time. Well, not everybody's brain is shaped the same. So you have to warp them so that they all over, like the same part of the brain is overlying the same part of the brain on everybody's scan. So they call that a warp field, <laughs> which is wrong because it doesn't have anything to do with traveling fast. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, I think they're basically saying have a better way of doing that so that I imagine it's only improved. Yes. Uh, and also, this is the first study to apply this method specifically to people with bipolar disorder. Uh, furthermore, just to kind of explain it, uh, the longitudinal change of this four year period um, in gray matter density was assessed using the MRI machine and was then evaluated using this tensor based morphometry with this specialized software. Um, the age, the interscan interval, and the sex were included as covariates in the analyses. And the differences in the images compared between the bipolar 1 subjects and the control subjects in this uh, specialized software uh, used general linear modeling. Uh, the whole brain analysis also supplemented or was supplemented with a small volume correction image for both the amygdala and the hippocampus. So is that like a focus in on that one area or something specifically? I think so. Yeah. I think it's... That's kind of what I got out of it. This, yeah. They were really interested specifically in that area, so they did extra like processing in that area to make sure that everything was overlaid correctly on everything else. So for the cognitive and clinical correlations, uh, they found significant clusters of gray and white matter loss um, in individual cluster mass volumes. Uh, they imported this data into SPSS and they used discriminant function analysis to predict group membership. So they were seeing if um, gray matter loss predicted whether they had bipolar disorder or they were the control in the control group. Um, the changes in gray and white matter density were estimated and compared with their cognitive function, so their um, different types of IQ, as well as their clinical outcomes. So again, um, the subgroups of patients were defined by treatment with um, class of medication at their baseline. So whether they were on lithium or on uh, mood stabilizers, So all participants except one bipolar subject uh, underwent the reassessment at the four-year follow-up. Uh, 17 out of 20 of the bipolar patients were euphemic, which just means that they were in a stable mood, um, so they weren't in a manic or depressive episode, but they also hadn't had either of those episodes for a period of time. Um, subjects had on average 
during the four-year period, one depressive and one uh, manic or hypomanic um, episode. And the number of um, manic episodes that occurred during the follow-up period were correlated with gray matter loss in both the cerebellum and temporal lobe. And I might have more notes about that, but my tablet died. So. Um, can you guys see the parts on the brain scan okay? The white? Yeah, because if not, I... It is really a bad color choice on their part. Yeah, I made it yellow. I don't... Can you see that better? Much okay. better. Okay. So even though it's yellow and that spectrum includes yellow in it, which I didn't realize until after I did it, um, it's it's really white. So it's a very high T statistic. So I put a little square of yellow there just to let you know that that was my goal. Um, so I tried really hard to figure out how to accurately read this scan, and I still don't know, but. I think that the two left images here are of the bipolar patients, and I, I'm assuming that this is the baseline, and this is at the four-year follow-up period, and the only reason that I assume that is because um, this region here, which is, uh, I think it's the cerebellum, uh, it gets smaller, so I guess that they saw Reduction and my was, guess is that that's probably not right, but, no. but my reason for thinking that is the numbers that you see up there, mm -hmm. and those sort of imply that it's moving through a single brain, like each one of those, like minus 12 at the bottom. What the heck was that? that was I thought it was, you know, some of these photon torpedoes going on. <laughs> um, yeah, I know it's pathetic. Uh, so if you look at the very top left, it says, what, minus 42, and then the bottom it says minus 12. So that makes me think that it's some kind of sequential slices we're looking at, and I'm betting that the, the yellow areas are the ones that were significantly different between the groups. Yeah. Okay. So those are just the differences. I don't think they're comparing, I don't think there's an illustration of one versus the other. I think they're just showing us what was different Okay. without having this. Yeah see the two differences just that's my theory yeah I think that was my initial theory and then I thought why are there why are there so many I don't know. they just want to drive us crazy yeah. they definitely too didn't much explain data. it in any way shape or form so um but the uh, top two rows are the cerebellum and this third row here is the fusiform gyrus and then the last one is the hippocampus so they saw a gray matter loss um, more gray matter loss in bipolar patients compared to the controls. Uh, they saw greater gray matter loss in bipolar patients in the left hippocampus, the fusiform gyrus, and the cerebellum. Uh, bipolar patients also showed some evidence of lower gray matter de density in the inferior temporal cortex compared to the controls, and they did not find significant differences in white matter. So by that you mean there was no difference in the amount of change. So like whatever change there was in the controls in white matter was the same as the change in the bipolar people in white matter. Yeah, at least there okay. was no significant. There's no difference between the two groups. Okay. Um, I included pictures of the piece of form cars because I have forgot where they were, so just in case anyone else did. Um, in this highlighted area and um, the progressive reductions in the hippocampal and fusiform gray matter uh, were substantially se substantially separated the bipolar and the control groups and they were uh, associated with progressive deterioration in general intellectual function as well. Does anybody remember another time that we've talked about the fusiform? Gyrus. She, uh, Sally said the fusiform face area. Yeah, there's a part of the fusiform gyrus, actually several parts of it that are involved in the recognition and perception of faces in particular and also body parts. So interesting. You, did you say they had trouble recognizing emotions? Mm -hmm. 
and it's also involved in object <coughs> oh, yes. uh -huh. uh, perception uh -huh. too. Um, and other studies have found that abnormalities in bipolar uh, patients, yeah, they demonstrated, which they demonstrated using facial affect recognition tests, um, suggest that this region may also play a role in emotional processing uh, as well as sustained attention. I had ne never heard that about bipolar people. I didn't realize yeah, they had that kind of deficit. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't think it's the same as some of the brain damage right. people are using. Not that they couldn't necessarily recognize their faces, just they had more slower yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Is that more when they're in their manic episodes that they have problems recognizing facial expressions? Uh, so it's not when they're in a manic episode, but the more manic episodes that they've experienced was related to that difficulty. Yeah, so that kind of um, implies that the more episodes you have, particularly the manic episodes, the more it changes your brain. Um, so this graph shows the discriminant function analysis that they did to um, uh, predict group, uh, which group they belonged in, whether they were bipolar or the control patients. And basically it just shows that um, the, it, the um, amount of gray matter loss that the participants had if they were bipolar, then they had more temporal gray matter loss, since they are leaning more towards the end on the x-axis, and then also more cerebellar gray matter loss, whereas the control patients were closer to the zero mark. Wow, that's a really good distinction. I mean, it's not perfect, obviously, but it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so just to be a little more specific, um, the temporal lobe cluster value correctly classified around 86% of the control subjects and around 65% of the bipolar subjects. So yeah, that's pretty, pretty good. Okay. So the uh, cognitive results, they found significant and of course found significant findings. Um, reductions in the full scale and performance IQ was significantly associated with this gray matter loss in the temporal lobe. And additionally, the, uh, there was a negative association between gray matter loss in the cerebellum and their verbal IQ reductions over time, just in bipolar subjects. Um, I put question marks and tried to explain it to myself because they're saying that a negative association between the gray matter loss and verbal IQ reductions so it's two negatives, gray matter loss and IQ reductions, but there's a negative association. So 